Amen. Amen. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to see everybody. Appreciate you being here. And uh, beautiful morning the Lord has made. Amen. 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 A little muggy out there, but praise the Lord for that. That means we got a little bit of moisture out there. We don't have drought. Amen. Amen. Uh, praise the Lord. God's good to us. We uh, get ready to open up our service in prayer. Uh, remember Dina Hoffman, if you will. Continue to lift her up in prayer. Uh, we talked to Kent yesterday, and he said that she was still having a pretty bad time of it, and not, not feeling well. And so uh, y'all keep her in prayer. Uh, Pat White, she, uh, as far as I know, is still in the hospital uh, from her surgery. Probably be there till tomorrow. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so uh, had, they found a little bit of uh, uh, bacteria uh, in, uh, in the bone. And they said it had been in there ever since she'd had the uh, uh, accident. So uh, uh, we're thankful that it hadn't gotten any worse and that they found it when they did. And so that may have been the source of a lot of her problems. So they're trying to get that cleared up. So y'all keep Pat in prayer. Uh, remember Linda Troxel. Uh, she's uh, up in Michigan and she'll be traveling back, uh, I guess, in another week or so. And so y'all keep her in prayer. Vicki Bazin is going to be tested for COVID this morning. She said that she had had several of the symptoms. And so uh, she asked that we remember her in prayer. Uh, remember Doris Wilkins, she's going to see the surgeon about her hip on August the 2nd. Uh, continue to keep uh, Mr. Wingfield in prayer. Uh, he's still waiting uh, results back from where they did the uh, uh, chest x-ray or whatever it was that they did there. And also remember our teens. Uh, our teens will be leaving out Wednesday uh, for their mission trip. And uh, if you want to know where they're going, I guess you better talk to Matt because uh, I'm not at liberty to say. But uh, anyway, they're, uh, they're getting packed up and, plan and getting plans made for uh, leaving out Wednesday afternoon about 6 o'clock. If uh, you're going to bring any clothes or uh, non-perishable food in for them to distribute on their trip, you need to do that today. Uh, so if you didn't get it this morning, please bring it in this afternoon because they're going to start loading up everything. Hello. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. All right. Uh, did y'all hear anything I said? Yeah. Okay, good, good. So, <laughs> remember uh, remember the team trip and, and go ahead and get the items in. If you're bringing some, get them in this evening. Uh, any other prayer requests this morning? It, it's good to have uh, uh, Julian and Faye with us this morning. Faye took a terrible fall, and we just need to praise the Lord that she's able to be here this morning. She fell down. A flight of steps, it was 14 steps, fell down head over heels and I guess backwards pretty much. And uh, praise God, just a bump on her head and a, and a bruise and a, uh, praise the Lord, no broken bones. Right. She's able to be with us this morning. She is having some problems with her knee and, and leg and so y'all, not from the fall, it was what caused the fall. And so y'all keep her in prayer as well this morning. But Faye, we're glad you're able to be with us this morning. Praise the Lord for that. Yes, sir, James. Uh, praise some man yesterday. We had one rededicate their life. Amen. We didn't have many, but uh, one of the things happened yesterday is a uh, gentleman was getting clothes and he uh, reached in the pocket and he found several hundred dollars in the pocket. He gave it back to us. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we're going to use it to program our ministry, especially to help them out. But praise the Lord. I can assure you that was not a pair of my pants. I know that. Lord <laughs> work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amen. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Yes, sir. One of our honor guard members was done. Stanley had a spot on his lung, and he has had a prior lung operation. Uh, this was about a month and a half ago. He was supposed to win in last Wednesday to have it to do the operation, get it removed. Yes, sir. And when he done a follow up view. So, <laughs> on guard members have been praying for Hallelujah. Praise God. Yes, God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I invite you to come to the altar this morning and cast these cares upon the Lord and pray that our hearts will be prepared for what He has for us. I the altar hope that you'd like to come.
Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for this day, and we just give you praise for an opportunity to be able to come together this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to worship you and to enjoy the fellowship uh, within the body of Christ. We just thank you, Father, for each soul that's here this morning. And Father, we all need to realize today that we're here because uh, you've, you've drawn us here. Uh, Lord, whatever reasons that we might think that we're here, we know that you've got us here to do a work in our lives. And so, Father, we're thankful today that we are in the potter's house, that we're the clay and you're the potter, and that you're going to uh, be able to do your work in our lives. And so, Father, help us to be open to that. Help us to be sensitive to the uh, move of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts. I pray, Father, that you help us to be surrendered to the authority of the Word of God. Uh, Father, we're thankful for your Word this morning. Uh, Lord, that we know that it is a, a true and steadfast, that it never changes, that it is a solid foundation that we can build our life upon. So we give you praise for the Word of God. We thank you for the living word this morning, our Savior Jesus Christ. And we just pray, Father, that everything that is said and done in this service would glorify Jesus. We pray that he would be exalted in this service and uh, lifted up. And we'll thank you and praise you for that. Your word tells us that when Christ is lifted up, he will draw all men nigh unto him. And so, Father, may he be lifted up in this service this morning. And, God, I pray that when we leave from here, we can say that we're closer to Jesus than when we came in. And so, Father, you have your way. We'll thank you and praise you for all that you do in our life this morning. Father, we pray for those that are suffering, those that are weak in body. We, uh, we've had several mentioned by name here this morning. And so, Lord, we know uh, today that you know every case, you know every need, you know every weakness, every affliction, and uh, every trial. And so, God, we're thankful today that as we lift these prayer requests up to you, we can pray your will be done. And we know, God, that's exactly the, or absolutely the best thing that can happen. And so, Father, please have your hand upon those that are weak. Be with those that are in the hospitals, those that are traveling. Uh, Father, be with those that are uh, waiting test results. Lord, we just pray that you comfort hearts and minister to, to bodies. And, uh, Lord, our, our desire is that folks will be healed. We thank you for answering prayer for this uh, gentlemen in the honor guard, we just we give you praise for that. We know that you still you are still in the healing business. You're still in the saving business, and so Father, we just uh, we give you praise this morning. Have your way in this service. Speak to our hearts. Change our lives. Uh, God save uh, the one that may be here today that's lost. And God, I pray that you strengthen those that are saved. We'll give you the praise for it all, folks. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Amen. In our books this morning, turn to 564. 564. Let's stand as we sing, please. <laughs>
Uh, I know you've seen the tree outside, and I'm going to explain that to you. But you know, as we're talking about Merry Christmas in July, uh, we don't get caught up on what the, uh, the, the hallmark and all that what? says about it. <laughs> but we do know the real meaning of Christmas, and that's to celebrate the birth of our Christ yes. and Savior. And um, so um, we are getting ready to get started on our kickoff for our shoe boxes. So I have a small video I'd like for you to watch first. So growing up, life was really tough for me and my family. We couldn't afford the basic things. I raised in a poor family. In the orphanage, we did not have anything that was ours. And I didn't expect anything. I remember opening it, and inside there was so much color, like the rain. And I was just so happy to have a gift for myself. That I loved it. How could so many beautiful things be packed in one box? And who would have done such a thing? To this day, it impacts me. To this day, I feel the love of God. Thank you for being a blessing in my life without even knowing me. In that moment, I realized how God was in my life. God has been so faithful to me. And that's not say thank you. The shame once represented his love and his redemption in my life. So this year needs to be no different. Right. So uh, we have goals to meet, and we'll talk about that. But uh, for our kickoff, there's a tree in the foyer, and on that tree, there's uh, little uh, ornaments. <laughs> and on the back of it, you'll see something like this one says, 10 boxes of pencils. So if you'll just take uh, ornament, and uh, you take that, and between now and August 15th, there'll be a tub out there for you to bring those items back in. We're going to let the kids pack them. And it's just sort of a kickoff. That's not all you need to do. You still need to do what you normally do and more. But uh, it is a little kickoff just to get it started. So if you'll make sure you get a little ornament off the tree and um, buy those items. Um, there's also a donation box out there on the table. I know some people may not be able to go to a store. And we'll do that for you. So if you have a donation, put that in there. Uh, also, um, you know, watching that video, it just, uh, it amazes me because of our children and ourselves. I know what love feels like, you know. And most of you all know what love feels like, whether it was from our parents or your kids. or, or But we know the feeling of love and to think that a child doesn't know <laughs> The feeling of love just breaks my heart. So we're going to try to be a part of that and get that out there to them so that they, we can make a difference in those children's lives. God's uh, love for those that don't know Him, the fact that it can be done through a shoebox amazes me, and the fact that God's going to allow us to be a part of that. So just be sure and get your little things off the tree, bring them back in, and go ahead and start making your shoe boxes also. Let's make a difference. Amen. 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 I tell you, those uh, those videos just it kind of gives up, makes us aware of things that we don't really even comprehend that. We live here where we've got clothes and shoes and food and all of that, and we've got access to all those kind of things. And then uh, there's so much of this world that has none of that. And uh, we have the opportunity to uh, send out these little red and green missionaries all over the world. And we need to, uh, it, and, and you know, it's not difficult. It's not hard. It may be a little bit of a sacrifice to be able to buy some of those things and to 
put together several shoe boxes. There may be a sacrifice involved in that. But boy, what a what a great way to be able to send the gospel out, uh, and and really kind of fairly easy, you know. Yeah. And so uh, be in prayer for that. Uh, like Penny said, go ahead and get those little. Uh, ornaments off, and there's boxes already made up out there that you can take. Uh, go ahead and start, go ahead and start them in. Yeah, go ahead and start filling them up and bringing them in. And uh, sometime in November, we'll be shipping them out. So uh, uh, we don't we don't want to procrastinate, do we? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me make a few announcements. Uh, sign ministry tomorrow night, uh, six thirty. And if you'd like to be a part of that ministry, you let me know. We'll make sure that you have a sign and an assignment, uh, a street corner up there in Archdale to be able to stand on and lift up the Word of God. Men, our uh, men's ministry meeting is the 29th of this month. And also on the inside of the bulletin, you will see a uh, date change about three-fourths of the way down on the first column there. Uh, the men's prayer breakfast at Gospel Baptist Church that was scheduled for September the 4th, I believe it was, uh, the date has been changed to October 30th. Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson was not, he had a conflict in schedule and he's not going to be able to be there on the 4th. And so uh, they've rescheduled him to be there on October 30th. So go ahead and sign up. Uh, we will still have 40 tickets available to us. And if you'd like to go and be a part of that, make sure that your name's on the list out there in the foyer. Uh, the mission trip we've already made mention of. Go ahead and get those items in and keep those uh, the teens and the teen leaders in your prayers as they uh, go on their mission trip. General board meeting today. If you're on the general board, be here at 4.30. Choir practice today at 5 o'clock. So uh, if you are a member of the choir, make sure that you're here. And there's some other announcements in there that are very important about children's ministry, bus ministry, ministry opportunities that you need to make sure that you're aware of. And finally, the uh, uh, camp meeting, 10th Annual Sof Sophia Camp Meeting uh, uh, is listed in there too, as well as uh, let you have... That information, but also uh, remind you to keep that in prayer. Anything else need to be announced? All right, let's worship the Lord with that. Okay. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you this morning, we just want to thank you, Lord, for your goodness, yes, for your grace, for your mercy, for your peace that passes all understanding. Thank Lord, you, us. God. I love you this morning. Thank you for your love. Thank you that we're able to share your love, Lord, through, uh, through uh, your son and through the shoeboxes, Lord. I just yes. pray, Lord, that each and every one that goes out, Lord, would uh, accomplish your will. Father. Yes. Don't let it be about us, but let it be about you and your yes. son. We just love you and praise you. Bless this offering for, for the brotherhood of your kingdom. Yes, Lord. I pray, Lord, you bless those that have to give, those that have not. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank uh, Jesus for saving me this yes, morning. Sir. Amen. Amen.
confess with my mouth and I remember when I remember when he saved my soul under the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thy heart who shall ascend up to heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, 
For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Father, we come once again before the throne of grace. And we are thankful to be here today. And Father, as a, as, a, as a Christian, as a child of God, I am so thankful that I remember when you saved my soul. And I hope and I pray, Father, that, that many here this morning have that, that blessed remembrance of when you touched their heart, when you convicted their heart, opened their blinded eyes. Father, that day that they surrendered their life to you. God, I, I just pray that many in here have that blessed assurance today. But Lord, if there's one here that does not, if there's more than one here that does not have that blessed assurance, does not have that hope of heaven, the hope of eternal life, God, I pray that today might be the day that they call upon the name of Jesus Christ for the pardon and forgiveness of sin, that they might have their name written in the Lamb's book of life. Father, you save souls. Strengthen the church today. Uh, convict our hearts, Lord, that we might uh, go and be the witness that you've called us and equipped us to be. But Father, you have your way. Let the Holy Spirit move here in, in, in power. Let your word go forth and accomplish what is pleasing to you. Help me, God, to bring out what you've put in me. Lord, we'll thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I think this morning as Christians, there is no way that we could not just be amazed at the Apostle Paul. Sure. I mean, if you know anything about Paul, if you know anything about the New Testament, and you know about his life. Several times in there, Paul gives a description of what his life was like after he came to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. There's just absolutely no way that we, uh, we can't just, just be amazed to think of a man that gave so much of himself, that sacrificed so much of himself for the cause of Christ. I look at Paul and, and I think, my goodness, I am so far from anything of being like Paul. And yet Paul wasn't the only one that sacrificed and gave of themselves. There were many. But I will tell you what, when you look at Paul's life and you hear his testimony, I think about when he wrote to Timothy his final testimony and he told him from the Mamertine prison, he wrote to him and he said, I'm ready to be offered up. And I can't help but think what kind of physical shape Paul must have been in at that time of his life. I mean, he was in, uh, look it up, look up at the prison that Paul was in in Rome. Uh, what they did, they had a holding cell for those that were to be tried, and then they had a hole in the floor of that holding cell that they would let those that were basically death row inmates, they would put them down in that hole, down into a section of the prison where there was no light, there was no air circulating, and more than likely that's where Paul spent his last days, was in that inner prison. And I can't help but think that after years of traveling, I mean, he, he spent years traveling, and folks, we're modern Christians, and, and when we think about travel, we think about getting in the car and going somewhere. We think about getting on a bus and going, or we think about hopping on a plane and going. Paul had none of that. Right. I mean, the travel in those days was very difficult, and it was very dangerous. And yet Paul spent years traveling about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as he traveled, the Bible tells us that he was in peril to his own countrymen. He was in peril to false brethren. There were Jews that were constantly after him. To, they wanted him dead. And the Bible says that he suffered stonings and beatings and shipwrecks. There were times and seasons in his life where he went without basic necessity. The Bible says Paul's own testimony was, I was cold and naked. And you think about that, and then in his last days, he's writing, sending out letters, encouraging Timothy to stand for the faith. He's writing letters and encouraging Christians to, to fight the good fight and to keep the faith and to finish the course. Amen. What in the world was it about Paul that caused him, even after being beaten and, and, and shipwrecked and, and after years of just hardships and trials, what was it about Paul that kept him going? I think the very first verse that we
we read, the very first part of it gives us an indication of what it was that motivated Paul. He said, brethren, my heart's desire. Paul had a desire within his heart. Amen. He said, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That was the desire in his heart that moved him and that motivated him to keep on running the race, to keep on fighting the fight. Amen. I want to preach on that this morning. Driven by heart's desire. The Greek word that is translated heart is cardia. And it's probably where we get our word cardio. I don't know for sure, but I would imagine. But what it means is the center of a thing. The cardia means the center of the thing. And so when we're talking about a heart's desire, we're talking about the, the center of a man or a woman. It's talking about what makes us up, what motivates us, what moves us. And I'm going to tell you something right now. We need a heart's desire like Paul had. Amen. In these days when it's getting tougher and tougher to walk with Jesus Christ, when it's getting tougher and more difficult to be faithful to the, to the Word of God and to our Lord and Savior, I'm going to tell you right now, we need to be driven by a heart's desire. Amen? Amen. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that the heart is the center of our thoughts and intentions. Amen? Amen? For Paul to say, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. What Paul was saying was, this is what consumes me. This is what's always on my mind. This is what always moves me. This is, what I, this is why I intend to do what I'm doing is because of what's in my heart. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, we need that kind of desire this morning. Amen? We need a desire for God's glory. We need a desire for His kingdom. We need a desire for the lost. That's the kind of desire that Paul had. So I want us to look at what Paul had as far as a heart's desire. Paul, first of all, we see that he had a heart's desire for the lost. Didn't he? Outside of Jesus Christ, I don't know that there's ever been a man or a woman that had more of a burden for the lost than Paul. I mean, that's what moved him. That's what motivated him. That's what caused him to endure all the hardships and the trials was his burden for the loss. Paul said it was his heart's desire. Now I'm going to tell you something. I've said many times that I want my lost loved ones to be saved. I've heard you pray. Lift up prayer requests. My lost children. I want my lost children to be saved. I want this guy at work to be saved. I want, I want this and I want that. But I, 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 I want to ask you this morning, do we really have a heart's desire for the loss? I mean, it's evident with Paul that he had that desire. Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, we, can, we can't look at what we, were, what we read here and we can't look at his testimony throughout the Scriptures and deny that Paul had a heart's desire for the lost. That's why he went through everything that he went through. So it's evident in Paul's life. But folks, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know that that is evident in our life today. He said, Preacher, why are you always so hard on us? I I'm going to tell you something right now, folks. We, we need to have that heart's desire that drives us today for God to be glorified, for His kingdom to build, be built up, for the lost to be saved. Amen. It's critical that we have that. So we see with Paul that he had that heart's desire, and we see what he endured, and we know Paul even said at one point, I am willing to give up my own salvation if it meant the salvation of my brethren. Right. Now you think about that. Paul said, I'd be willing to give up my own salvation. I'd be willing to die and go to hell if I knew that my Jewish brethren would be saved. I mean, those are strong words. That, that's something that's coming out of his heart. No wonder he was willing. Hey, the, there's a time in Paul's life when they stoned him. They drug him outside the city. They left him for dead. Everybody thought he was dead. That's why they drug him outside the city. And then the Bible tells us that Paul got up and he went back into the city and preached Jesus. What would cause a man to do that? That kind of burning desire in his heart for people to be saved. Do we have that? Let me just ask you a few questions this morning. Do we weep in prayer for the lost? We'll, we'll be quick to throw up a prayer request. 
And I'm sure that we, we make mention of the lost in our prayers. We should. But do we weep for those that are lost? Do we fast for those that are lost? Do we load our pockets down with tracts so that we're prepared to share the gospel? Even if we only have a minute or two that we can put a track in somebody's hand that has the gospel message in it. Do we intentionally do things to reach the lost? Do we intentionally do things that reach the lost? That, that's evidence of having a heart's desire for the lost. Y'all with me? Just wave at me. Just, just, I love y'all. <laughs> Listen, we need a heart's desire for Why are we here today? Why are we here today? You know why we're in church today? The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12, it says that we're here today. You've got a preacher standing before you today. You've got Sunday teach, school teachers that's going to teach you here in a little bit. And the reason you're here is so that you can be prepared for the work of the ministry. So that you can go out and minister the gospel to those that are lost and hurting. That's right, man. Amen. Amen. That's why we're here and we need that desire and we need, to, we need to honestly answer these questions. Do we weep for the lost? Do we fast for the lost? Do we prepare ourselves to hand out the gospel message? Do we intentionally do things to reach the lost? And, and let me tell you something. Jesus Christ, our example, our Savior and our example, He intentionally did things to reach the lost. Every one of you probably that know the Scriptures a little bit, you've got things popping in your mind of how Jesus intentionally did things to reach the lost. The one that you got to have in your mind is the woman of Samaria at Jacob's well. Jesus was going from Jerusalem, Judea to Galilee and, and, and the normal route, he didn't take it. He intentionally went out of his way to reach this woman of Samaria who was lost. And she wasn't some friend of the Jews. She was an enemy of the Jews, so to speak. Hey, she, they didn't get along. It didn't matter to Jesus. He intentionally went out of his way. He intentionally made that sacrifice. He went up there and, and he witnessed to that woman and he told her about a living water that if she would drink from that living water, she'd never thirst again. But Jesus is not the only one that intentionally does things to reach the laws. Philip Philip intentionally went out of his way. He was, in, he was in Jerusalem. Jerusalem for the Jewish people was just kind of like their, uh, I mean, that, that was their haven of rest. That was their place, man. That's where the temple was. That's where the worship of God was. That's where the Levites led the worship and the singing and the, and the music and everything. They loved being, and especially as a Jewish convert to Christianity, especially one that had been converted uh, as a follower of Jesus Christ, they wanted to be there for the worship of God, but also to be able to witness to those around there uh, in Jerusalem. So Peter, man, he was, he was in Jerusalem. He was in the place that he wanted to be, and yet he intentionally left the safety and the joy of Jerusalem, and he went, the Bible tells us that he went into a, the desert of Gaza. Amen? The desert of Gaza. That would be like you saying, Preacher, we don't want to sit in the air condition anymore. We don't want to sit in the soft seats anymore. We want to go stand in the gravel parking lot when it's 95 degrees. That's where we want to be. <laughs> but in a sense, that's what Philip did. He left the place of joy and the place of worship and he went into the desert, into the Gaza, uh, in the, into Gaza, in the place of the desert. You know why he went there? Because there was an Ethiopian unit down there that was seeking God and he went down there to tell him about Jesus. He was intentional. Peter was an intent. He was intentional when it came to winning the laws. Peter went to a Gentile's home. Now I'm going to tell you something. Peter, <laughs> if there was ever outside of Paul a prouder Jew, it was Peter. If you remember the account in the Bible, in the book of Acts, the Bible says that Peter was up on the roof and he, and he was kind of in a trance or he was getting ready to eat or he was praying and, and he was up there and God spoke to him in a vision and, and the Bible says that this sheet came down out of heaven and it had all manner of animals in it. And 
the Lord spoke to Peter and said, eat. And Peter said, oh, not so, Lord, not me. Nothing unclean has ever come across these lips. God said, I can't believe you, Peter. You're calling that which I have made unclean. And Peter repented. And God said, listen, there's somebody at the door looking for you. And there was a couple servants had come from a man's house up there. It, Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile. He was a centurion. And Peter intentionally swallowed his pride. Did what he was not comfortable doing. And he went with them. Now let me tell you something. In those days, if a Gentile went to a Jew's home or a Jew went to a Gentile home, they didn't go in. Gentiles knew that the Jews thought that they would be unclean if the Gentiles entered their home. And a Jew had that same thought about entering a Gentile's home. If I go in there, I'll be unclean and I can't worship God. I can't go into the temple and worship God. When Peter got to Cornelius' home, he stopped at the gate. Old habits die hard, amen? He stopped at the gate, and they invited him in. And he went in, and he preached the gospel to them. And Cornelius was saved at his house. You know why? Because Peter intentionally went to them. He went to them. He didn't say, I'll oh, tell them to come to me. He didn't say, oh, I can't go to them. They're Gentiles. He intentionally went and witnessed to them. Brothers and sisters, that is critical that we understand that as, as, as having a heart's desire, it would drive us to be intentional about witnessing. In other words, whosoever God brings across our path, we are ready to share the gospel with them. Amen. That ought to be our heart's desire. And I'm going to tell you, church, we don't have it. But I'm not so, I'm not, hey, listen, not just Hope Baptist Church, the body of Christ has lost its heart's desire for the lost to be saved. Right. We need to have a burning desire. We need to be able to answer those questions. Do we weep for the lost? Yes, we weep for the lost. Do we fast for the lost? Yes, we fast for the lost. Do we load up our pockets with tracts so that we will be ready in a moment to give out the gospel? Yes, we do that. Do we intentionally go out looking for opportunities to witness? Do we intentionally go and try to reach the lost? Yes, we do that. Well, I'm going to tell you why. That will show that we have a heart's desire, that we are driven by a heart's desire for the lost. Amen. Secondly, Paul had a heart's desire for the lost to be truly saved. For way too long, we have accepted false conversions. For way too long, we have accepted that someone is saved, or maybe we've accepted it about ourselves that we are saved simply because we say we love Jesus. Paul said, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, for I bear them record that they have a zeal for God. They had a zeal for God. They had a love for God. And yet Paul said they needed to be saved. Just because someone says, oh, I love God or I love Jesus is not true salvation. Amen. 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 Many today express a love for God, a love for the Lord, but not according to knowledge. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people living in sin. Now listen to me. They're living in sin. They didn't fall into sin. They weren't overtaken by a fault. They're living in sin. They're making the choice to live sinful lifestyles. And yet, you ask them, are you saved? Oh yeah, I love the Lord. I love Jesus. Brother sisters, let me tell you something. A zeal for God is not salvation. Amen. It's not. Their salvation is not according to knowledge. They are ignorant of true salvation. You say, preacher, are you trying to judge people's salvation? Are you trying to judge their heart? No, I'm just wanting to tell you what the Word of God says. 
Paul, look, look in, uh, in, in chapter 10 there. Look at verse uh, 6 and 7. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thy heart who shall ascend up to heaven, that is to bring Christ down from the above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Look at verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Now let me tell you something. I, I, Romans chapter 10, man, I've been in Romans chapter 10 a, a long time. I mean, I, I, I can quote most of it to you and things like that. I love Romans chapter 10. That's where you, you go when you want to try to you know, share the gospel with somebody and see somebody get saved. But I want you to know that verses 6 and 7, it was only when I was studying for this message this week that I really feel like I got a grasp of what Paul is saying here. What Paul is saying is that in order to understand what salvation is, to have salvation according to knowledge, we don't need to go up to heaven and bring Jesus down again. We don't need to descend into the deep and bring him up from the dead again. You know why? What saith it? The word is nigh thee. We don't have to get Jesus to come down. We don't have to get Jesus to come up. We got the word of God that tells us what true salvation is. What saith it? The word is nigh thee. Even in our mouth and in our heart, the word of faith that we preach, it's right here. This tells us what it is to be truly saved. But yet we've got so many people today that are willing to say I'm saved but not according to the knowledge of the Word of God. Oh, I love Jesus. And yet I choose to live a sinful lifestyle. That's not according to knowledge. Let me show you something. Go over to John. Gospel of John. Chapter 14. John chapter 14. Y'all still glad you came? Amen. Well, good. John chapter 14, look at verse 15. Y'all know it? What did Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I love the Lord. Yeah, I'm saved. I love Him. And yet I choose to live a sinful lifestyle. What? That's not, that's not salvation according to knowledge. I, I really don't think I'm interpreting this wrong. If, if I am, don't correct me right now. Come to me after the service and correct me. But I don't, I, listen, if, if, you, if you're saved and you say you love the Lord, Jesus says you'll keep my commandments. Right. Right. Now look, we're going to fall, we're going to fail. Sure. But we don't choose to live a life of failure. Right. We don't choose to live a life of continually falling into sin. If that's the case, then that is not salvation according to knowledge. Right. Jump over to chapter 15. Chapter 15. Look at verse 9 and 10. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. Let me tell you what true salvation is. True salvation is with everything that we have. We're striving to follow in the footsteps of Jesus with everything that we have. We're trying our best to keep the commandments of God. Yeah, I fail. Yeah, I fail daily. But that's not what I want. That's not what I desire. I want to be like Christ. Amen. True salvation. That's what Paul desired for his Jewish brethren. He says, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that they might be saved and I want them to be truly saved. I don't want it to be about their own righteousness. I, don't want, them, I, I want them to be submitted to God. See, a lot of people today that say they're saved, they're, they say they're saved because they have, they're, they're, they're proud of their own righteousness. Right. Yeah, they come to church faithfully. Yeah, they give tithes faithfully. Yeah, they take part in the ministry of the church faithfully. And that's their salvation. First church that I pastored, we had a young man there. When we got down there, his family was in the church. They were very involved in the church. His dad was a deacon. Uh, his, his mom was involved in the Sunday school ministry. Even this young man was involved in the Sunday school ministry. He was always the star of the Christmas play and things like that. And, and, you know, when you first go into a church, you don't know anybody. And so all you can see is the, you know, the things that they're doing and everything. And if you ask this young man about his salvation, yeah, I'm saved. But outside of the church, he lived a completely ungodly life. 
One Sunday he came wheeling into church with a new Mustang. Not a new one, but a new to him. Mustang 5.0, Brother Glenn. And after church, he said, Preacher, you going to go ride with me? I said, yeah, I'll go ride with you. Well, we get in there, and if you've ever been down New Hope Road between 49 and 109, you know it's like this. Well, he takes off down the road running about 70 mile an hour. Boom! And then he starts saying, Boy, I tell you what, I'm going to get some new tires on this thing. These things are bald as they can be. They're about ready to blow out. And I said, well, glory to God. If they do, I'm on my way to heaven. How about you? And I knew right then that young man was not saved. He backed it down to about 35 mile an hour. Turned white as a sheet. Took me back to the church, let me out. Wasn't too many Sundays after that, gave the altar call. Here he come. Here come his wife. Here come about four or five others. Got down there and got their hearts right with God. What they had was salvation, not according to knowledge. They had never been truly born again. They, oh, they've been in church and they tell you they love Jesus and they served in the church and things like that. They, you know what kind of salvation they had? They had a salvation based on their righteousness. Not, they had not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. For Jesus Christ is the end of law for righteousness to all who believe. I talk to preachers all the time that are concerned about people sitting in their churches that are not saved. People they see every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. People they see singing in their choirs. And yet they're not saved according to knowledge. It's evident, folks. Amen. Amen. If a person is truly born again, they'll keep the commandments because they are saved. They will not keep the commandments to be saved. Right. They'll keep his commandments because they are new creatures in Christ. They will keep his commandments because they have been born again. Amen? Amen. What Paul saw with his Jewish brethren, they were keeping the law, trying to establish their own righteousness instead of keeping in the law because they were righteous. You want to know what true salvation is? Go over to Ephesians chapter 2. Just want to give you some help here this morning. Ephesians chapter 2. Y'all still glad you're here? Amen. Good. Ephesians chapter 2. Y'all there? Amen. Look at verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's true salvation. Right. That you're saved not by any merit of your own. You're saved completely by the work of Christ. Amen. 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 And you want to know what that looks like? Look at verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. You know what that means? That means that you no longer live a life of sin. You've been, hey, you've been, you've been raised to a newness in life in Christ. I told somebody the other, oh, it was that guy that I told you we witnessed to the other Wednesday night, Henry. I told Henry, I said, Henry, you know what happened when I got saved? He said, what? I said, my wants to's changed. He said, oh, I, I like that. <laughs> I got saved, I didn't want the Budweiser anymore. When I got saved, I didn't want to cuss anymore. I didn't have to cuss anymore. When I got saved, I, hey, I didn't want the cigarettes anymore. That was a battle to get them things up, but I didn't want them anymore because I knew it hurt my testimony. What in the world happened? I was, hey, I was quickened. I was alive. I was no longer dead in trespasses and sin. Look what it says. Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our conversation in times past with the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, God changed all that. True salvation changes a man. True salvation changes a woman. You don't walk the way that you used to walk. True salvation takes us from disobedience to obedience. From being the, led by the lust of the flesh to being led by the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. True salvation takes us from death unto life. From darkness unto light. Woo, I'm glad I walk in the light. Amen. 
Say, preacher, you gone crazy. No, I'm just saved. And I'm glad about it. I'm happy about it. I'm not what I used to be. Glory. I can tell you right now, that lady right there is happy I ain't what I used to be. And she saw it. Oh, there was times when I tried to quit drinking. Every time I had a hangover, I tried to quit drinking. But man, I got saved that day, Brother Glenn, and it all went away. I didn't want it anymore. I was a new creature in Christ. Old things were passing away. All things were becoming new. He's still working on me. I'm not yet attained. But praise God, He's working on me. I got it. Hey, listen. The Bible says here that whosoever believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. I am not ashamed today to tell you that I'm saved. Amen. I'm not ashamed to tell you today that I'm trying my best to walk with Jesus. And you know why I'm not ashamed? Because you don't smell beer on my breath when I tell you that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, hey, I don't smell like I've been to the furnace when I tell you that. I don't smell like a, a pack of Winston's or a pack of Advantage. I don't even know if they make them anymore. I, that's what I used to smoke, Vantage Menthol. I don't smell like that anymore. You don't see that in my shirt pocket when I tell you I love Jesus. I'm not ashamed to tell you that today because I have been born again and I'm a new creature in Christ and I don't live the way that I used to. So I'm not ashamed to tell you that I'm saved. I know a lot of people today, you say, are you saved? They kind of hang their head down and say, yeah, I'm saved. <laughs> Whosoever believes on Him shall not be ashamed. That's true salvation. That's biblical salvation. That's salvation from the Word of God. Look at Romans chapter 10 again. Right quick. I'm about done. Romans chapter 10. You there? Amen. Verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Well, I tell you what. We can read past that and never give it a second thought. But true salvation is being able to honestly say, I confess that Jesus is Lord. Mm. That word Lord means master. That word master means you're a slave. That's right. Amen. If somebody's my slave and I say sweep the floor, guess what they do? If I'm somebody's slave and they tell me, you go stand on the street corner. You go to the hospital. You give that money. If I'm somebody's slave and they're my master and they tell me that, guess what I do? You see, we've been, we've been buying into this false salvation way too long. Amen. We've bought into it so long we don't even know what true salvation is. True salvation is that you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. Now, if God raised Him from the dead, He is more than capable of being our Savior. Amen. That's salvation according to knowledge. Paul had a heart's desire. He was driven by a heart's desire for the Jews to be saved, but not just to be saved, but to be truly saved. Brothers and sisters, do we have that kind of desire? I am guilty. I'll tell you this morning, I am guilty of people telling me that they're saved when I know that they're living a life of sin. And I say, well, glory to God, and I go on. I don't want to be that way anymore. Amen. I want to be driven by a heart's desire that they are truly saved according to knowledge. According to the Word of God. Amen. Amen. They say, preacher, so if a person's living a life of sin, they can't be saved. They can't be saved and enjoy it. They can't be saved and like it. They can be saved and miserable. They can be saved and be convicted. I believe they can be saved and be in that lifestyle, but they won't stay in that lifestyle. That's right. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't know why I would even want to take the chance. Yep. <laughs> I believe I, I've got a whole lot more peace following Jesus than satisfying the lust of the flesh. Yeah, yeah. Amen? 
So we need a heart's desire this morning. Very quickly, I want to tell you how we can get that, okay? How we can get a heart's desire. I'll give you three things real quick. First of all, we've got to be truly saved. Amen. We've got to be truly saved. Let me tell you something. A person that's not saved, they may have a desire for a person to live better. All right. All right. Our, our government up there that denies God wants people to live better. That's why they keep sending out them checks. Well, that's not the only reason, but we won't get into that. But a person that's not saved will want people to live better, but they don't want people to be born again. I, I've actually had people say, would you pray for my spouse that they would be saved? And I was yeah, we'll pray. Hallelujah. And then they get saved. And I mean, they get truly saved. And then all of a sudden, they back off and say, wait a minute, I, I, I don't want you to get saved and not become a fanatic. To have a heart's desire, to be driven by a heart's desire for people to be saved, we've got to be truly saved ourselves. Amen. Secondly, if you look in verses uh, 12 and 13, it says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me tell you something. A heart's desire will come when we realize that everyone needs to be saved. Everybody needs to be saved. And that whosoever God brings into our lives, whosoever God calls us to cross our path, they need to be saved. You say, well, what if they are saved? Well, they're not going to get mad if you ask them. I mean, <laughs> Oh, man, I've had, let me tell you something, I've, I've had people that, let me just tell you this, I am actually not on a parsonage door. Okay? Out door to door, out on door to door visitation, this was down in Denton, I knocked on the door, it was a parsonage door, it was a United Methodist Church parsonage. The lady came to the door, I introduced myself, and she said, well, I'm Pastor so-and-so's wife, and I said, well, great, and uh, I said, you know, I'm we talked a little bit, and I said, well, listen, I, I'm glad that y'all are here, and you're the pastor's wife, and he's, he's minister here, and things like that. But let me just ask you something. If you die today, would you go to heaven? She got angry. She got mad. She shut the door. She said, that's none of your business, and she shut the door. She said, preacher, you don't think she's saved? I don't know, but I know one thing. I don't know why a saved person would get mad if they were asked if they were saved. I don't know why a person on their way to heaven would get angry if they were on their way to heaven. Amen. Maybe she's saved and living in sin. And she's ashamed. Amen. But everybody comes across our path. God brings across our path. We need to realize they need to be saved. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? Amen. And then thirdly, Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? For how, and how shall they preach except they be sent? Let me tell you something right now. We have got to realize in order to have a heart's desire, to be driven by this heart's desire, we have got to realize that if we don't tell them, who will? If those who are truly saved will not tell, will not preach the gospel to every creature, how are they going to hear it? That ought to drive us. Amen. That ought to drive us. Because we don't know if that person that God brings across our path will ever meet somebody else that will tell them about Jesus. Right. So we've got to make the most of every opportunity. Amen? <laughs> we need a heart's desire, folks. And when we're talking about matters of the heart, there's only one place. There's only one person that can do anything about this heart. And that's Jesus. That's God. And so if we don't have that burning desire, and I want it, I want it, I don't have it, I don't have it like I want it. I want to get closer to Him. I can tell you this morning that, that as I pray, God is burdening my heart. I want that kind of desire. I don't want to miss an opportunity to put the good news in somebody's hand. Hey. And so I'm going to God. God, I need your help. I need that, I need that burning desire. I know I'm truly saved. I want that burning desire to tell others. We've got to have it. We've got to have it so that people don't die and go to hell. Amen. Amen. You stand with me this morning. Driven by a heart's desire. Heads bowed, eyes closed.
driven by a heart's desire. Do you have that desire in your heart this morning? Let me, let me ask you first with heads bowed and eyes closed. Do you have a desire to go to heaven? You know, the Bible just tells us that there's only two places that we're going to spend eternity. We're eternal souls, folks. Our souls are going to live on forever. And they're either going to live on forever with Jesus or they're going to live on forever in the torments and the flames of hell. Do you have a desire this morning to go to heaven? If so, can you say that you have been truly saved, truly born again? Or has God given you some knowledge this morning that what you've been basing your salvation on is your own good works? You've been basing your salvation on the fact that you don't drink or you don't do drugs or you don't smoke or you don't cuss, but you're not basing your salvation on knowledge from the Scriptures, and that is you must be born again. You can't trust in anything that you do, only in what Christ has done. Can you truly say this morning that He is your Lord and your Master, that when He says do it, you do it? <laughs> do you know today that you're saved? That you're on your way to heaven? If not, friend, today is a great day to be saved. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And I'm not going to try to embarrass you, but friend, if you need to be saved today, right where you stand, would you just slip your hand up? Preacher, that's me. I don't think I'm saved. I can't say that I'm a new creature in Christ. Everything that I see in my life that's good is because of my own efforts, my own merits. And I realize today it's all about my self-righteousness. It's not about the righteousness of God. And today I'm ready to submit my life to Him. I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. With every head bowed, every eye closed, friend, if that's you, would you slip your hand up today? Preacher, that's me. That's me. How many in here this morning that are truly saved, according to knowledge, would confess that you don't have that burning desire in your heart for the lost to be saved? And that today you'd like to ask God to help you to have that kind of desire that would motivate you and, and drive you to reach the loss for Christ. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? Yeah. Amen. Would any raise their hand in here this morning and say, you know what, preacher, I really, I, I'm saved and I'm, I'm thankful that I'm saved, but I'm, I'm not going to be a witness. I'm not going to tell others about Jesus. I'm just waiting on Jesus to come. Would anybody raise their hand to that this morning? Yeah. Well, I hope and I pray that our life proves the fact that we have a burden for the lost. Father, as we come to the close of this service today, your word is quick and powerful. It's a sword, a double-edged sword that cuts both ways. It convicts our hearts. It raises us out of our ease and shakes us and helps us to see, dear God, that that sometimes we think more highly of ourselves than we ought. So many times, Father, we, we kind of just put it in, in neutral and we just get to coasting. We need that desire, that burning desire in our heart like Paul had that would just keep on pressing forward, keep on pressing toward the mark of the high calling, be willing to suffer the loss of all things. Uh, God, that's the kind of desire we need that lost people might be saved. God, we do not want the souls, lost souls' blood on our hands. So God, I pray this morning that this message will not leave us anytime soon, but God, you'll continue to use it to prick our hearts. Lord, that we might become concerned and burdened for those that are lost and dying and headed for a devil's hell. God, don't let us accept any longer that false salvation. But God, let us, let us be concerned about salvation according to knowledge. And I pray, Father, that you'll, just, uh, you'll, you'll motivate us, you'll stir us, you'll set us on fire for Jesus. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. Be with us as we go into the Sunday school hour. Bless the students. Bless the teachers. We'll thank you and praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.